Welcome to the Confluence Parenting Podcast. We are here to motivate you and inspire you to become predictably calm, present, and proactive in your child's life. All parents are welcome here. A confluence is a coming together like two mighty rivers, a combining of strength. And this is what Confluence Parenting stands for, coming together, parent and child, to bring about joy and calm in the home. Join us now on the Confluence Parenting Podcast. Recording started. Welcome, welcome, welcome to the Confluence Parenting Podcast. This is Brandon Miller, and I am with my cousin... Tiffany Sankofa, and Hi. you are a uh, just a, a, a mistress of all sorts of skills, <laughs> including dog mistress video editing, <laughs> and and you're a mental health professional. You are a wife, a mom, a stepmom. You are a relatively new homeowner, and just in general, you're pretty darn amazing. <laughs> Welcome to my podcast, and I would Thanks love to having... invite you. <laughs> I'd love to invite you to introduce yourself and your family to our podcast listeners. Sure. <laughs> Thank you very much for asking me on, Brandon. I really appreciate you Absolutely. and everything you're doing at Confluence, as I mentioned. Um, and I just think you're such a gift to the community. And if I have anything helpful to add, I'm happy to. But I'm not pretending i am got it all together because I don't, even after 26 plus years of parenting. <laughs> <laughs> 25 years of therapizing but you know like like we're we said just before we started rolling here we're in a perpetual state of learning and unlearning right Fantastic. and i'm very grateful to be learning and unlearning with you and, and likewise it's a two-way street thank you absolutely so tell me about your family oh boy my family oh my family <laughs> so um, I have been married now for the second time. Um, uh, we've been together for 10 years. I've been a stepmom for 10 years. Um, I have a daughter who, from my first marriage who is 26 and a half years old. I literally got pregnant with her one month after starting my grad school therapist training. So she's been with me quite sincerely the entire time. So, <laughs> and she has been one of my best teachers. So currently she is off and on her own. She's a music therapist living in Annapolis, Maryland and and really bringing her gifts in some really fun to watch ways. I was saying my daughter is 26. Uh, my stepson is 18. He's now at college. So we're quasi empty nesters. And how's that going so far? It's pretty wonderful. <laughs> <laughs> Gotta now, say, love the kids, love them more when they come back after they've been away. So being that you are a mental health professional uh, how has that part of your life intersected with your the parenting part of your life you mentioned that your daughter was along for the ride the entire time the entire time <laughs> and so how have you seen that impact your parenting uh it's it's pretty amazing aside from just sort of always having that reference point you know because i worked with kids mostly when she was a kid now i work mostly with adults i still see some kids but um i focus more on on adults but when she was growing up, I was doing school-based for Hopkins um, in Baltimore City Schools and seeing kids and families in private practice. So you, she always, uh, she's just been such a good teacher her whole life, right? And she would give me perspective on things and even stuff like, you know, she always helped me set up my office oh, and cool. what, you know, and I would ask her, okay, is there something in here that would make this not feel good for a kid? And she's like, yeah, that's like cold or, you know, she, she made some really good points. So there's that, there's been her input. There's also this really interesting sort of parallel life thing that happened. My, my second professional job, so in my second year of, of um, practice, it's 23, almost 24 years ago, I started working for a guy named Rob Burdett. Uh, he's deceased now, but Rob was uh, probably the finest marriage and family therapist I've ever met in my entire life or even read and taught marriage and family at University of Maryland. He was the ecumenical chaplain at University of Maryland College Park for many decades until they eliminated that position. He, at that time, I was thinking about this before we came on, I'm actually older now than he was when I met him. That's weird. Oh, wow. Okay. That's really weird. <laughs> but he was already a dad and a stepdad and a granddad. Um, so he had all this knowledge and experience and wealth 
just as I was starting my parenting journey, because I, I, Jazz was like three when I first met Rob. And um, just his insight and his wisdom, his understanding of how kids tick, mm. it validated so many things that I believed, but I was afraid to trust. Sure. It's just a very natural um, style of parenting um, that now I understand. I didn't know at the time. I didn't know my roots. I didn't know you. I didn't know we were related. I didn't have my native roots yet. But an awful lot of this approach is very, very congruent with our Native American ancestors. It's this okay. understanding of, of all people, all beings are sacred, that respect is not something you can demand. That would be obedience, right? Right. But, but kids learn respect be, when they are respected. Yes. And when you see the sacredness of each being in your household, you act differently because all things affect all things. Yes. You know, so, yeah, it was just amazing, sort of an amazing journey. M my daughter brought me back to me, mm. you know, and, and I wasn't trying to use her for that. You know, I'm just trying to be a good mom. But, it, you know, she just had such a, a candid and natural truth, right? Then a lot of the things that I thought were supposed to be parenting didn't make any sense. And working with Rob and seeing Rob helped me let go of a lot of that. So there's this direct parallel too. I mean, if you understand how kids work, you understand how humans work. Yeah. So whether I'm working with a kid or a person who was once a kid, right? We're always working with every age we've ever been and an adult, right? So is, if you really understand the kid part of that, you understand the adult as well. Now, isn't it powerful though, as far as that giving respect, that like that unconditional respect? Absolutely. Man. Absolutely. Which which points to something really important that I sort of <clears throat> sort of formulated working as you know, as therapist and also with my child, sort of understanding that this this separation of personhood and behavior. Yes. Essential separation of personhood and behavior. We're all gonna screw up. It's what we do. We yeah. do our best not to screw up too horribly, terribly badly, but we all screw up and your kids are gonna screw up and you're gonna screw up as a parent, and that's okay. That doesn't mean you're a horrible, terrible person. That would be shame, which is an absolutely worthless teacher. Not helpful at all, because you are not your behavior. And if you're not your behavior, you have the freedom to look at it and go, wow, I really did F up there really badly. What do I want to do differently? Not get lost in, I'm such a terrible, horrible parent. But what do I want to do differently? Because that wasn't it. Absolutely. And now you're free to grow. For sure. And I think that's one of the, so I've been journaling since I was 20. So it's been quite a few years off and on. So not super consistent, but, but it's been the greatest tool for growing in self-awareness and just exactly what you're talking about. They're being able to separate myself from my behavior, the good, bad, and the ugly too. Absolutely. Um, and so uh, that, that's fantastic. And that's also a very powerful thing. Well, it also takes away that constant evaluation that, you know, it's a life or death. The, in, the, the thing that in our culture, that feels like a hierarchy of humans yes. and kind of constantly going, well, where am I on the hierarchy of humans? Well, guess what? We're all in the same spot. <laughs> There's no yeah. way around that. And sometimes we do wonderful things and sometimes we do horrible things and sometimes we just do things or forget to do things. But none of that has anything to do with our value or worth as a human being. That's what I meant by that mutuality and respect. You know, and you can model it. We get to model it in our households and then hopefully let it expand out. Oh, for sure. That the whole comparison game is, is a game not worth playing for sure. <laughs> <laughs> now, going back to your parents, so if you can take a look, if you can jump into that little time machine you have there in your, your room and zip back to day one of parenting. Sorry. Oh, God. <laughs> you mean that day I said, wait, what do you mean I take it home? <laughs> right. Exactly. <laughs> So, Actually, that was day three. But day three. So the, just those <laughs> early days of, of being a parent compared to, let's say, when, when Jazz was still at home. So let's say she was 17, 18, whenever she left home. Um, how have you grown as a parent? Oh, my God. <laughs> I was such a neurotic mess when she was an infant. And that was another gift that I got from Rob. One of the first things I ever heard from him about parenting was, the question is not if you're going to screw up. You're going to screw up. You know, because I was like, oh, my God, I'm going to totally mess up my kid. I'm going to totally mess up my kid. I have no idea what I'm doing. He's like, none of us have any idea what we're doing. If you had a manual, it would be wrong because this human being has never existed before. Yeah. And you're the only one who is her mother. So you're going to figure it out together. Right. 
And so he said one of the most important things we do as parents is model being an imperfect human. Because if you were not going to model that, if you were a perfect human, your kid would grow up and be completely lost. That and, okay, here's a parallel weird stories because I specialize in weird stories. My, my stepfather, who's absolutely a wonderful human being, in the hospital was holding my daughter at like two days. And he says, you know, it's really weird. We do all this, we clean up our hands and we put on a mask and we do all these things to be nice and sterile to hold somebody that poops in her pants all day long. <laughs> I was like, you know, there's a metaphor there. One of the things that I love watching you all in the way that you parent your kids in your household, right? It's just, it is a come as you are party. Life is messy. Yeah. So let's just make it work. That's a value for, for my wife and I. We want to be... The type of parent where our kids are feel, they feel safe to be who they need to be now that way when they are 18 19 and 20 or exactly you know, teens or when 16, they're dealing with it really scary yeah absolutely they yeah. I, I want them to be able to say you know what i really 100%. screwed up i i tried some of this or tried some of that i want 100%. to be able to talk to mom and dad about that so 100 percent. that was i had the exact same orientation towards jazz and it and it really did work very well we had very open conversations when she was a teenager. I didn't worry about her choices. She made really good choices. One of the, the, the most valuable progression that we take is asking our, our son, especially our youngest, but it works for both. So what is it that you're feeling right now? Okay, so you're feeling this. So with you feeling X, Y, or Z, what is it that you need? Mm -hmm. And helping him determine what, what he's feeling, helping him to grow in that uh, emotional awareness. And then... Yeah. Uh, helping him to d then determine what what do I need, and then like brainstorming mm -hmm. together, how can we meet those needs? That has cut down a billion and two hours worth of tantrums. I'm telling you, it's amazing. I was just talking with a dad tonight. He's a little perplexed. He has a five year old and a three year old, so they're not there yet. And but I'm still encouraging him to ask the questions. I said, do not expect them to be able to answer the questions. Stop asking your three year old why she did what she did. She has no idea. She did it because it felt good. That's it. It's that simple, you know, but asking the question prepares them for the next stage where they can answer the question. Absolutely. It gets their brain spinning on it. So I always, I always encourage people, you know, ask the question that's maybe uh, put a lot of things on the top shelf because you never know how high your kids can reach. Mm, I like that. Right. And if they get used to reaching for it, they grow into being able to do it. So you ask the questions that are above their developmental stage. Don't expect them to answer it, but you're laying foundation and groundwork for them to think that way. Because we're not raising kids. They're not going to always be kids. We're raising adults. Yes. So we have to teach them how to be adults in an age-appropriate, stage-appropriate way. So I do something I call fast-forward parenting. Ooh. So I'm always like, imagine that your child is 30 years old in a comparable situation. What skills do they need? Now, how do you take that down to whatever age they are? Right. That. So, you know, say your kid is, uh, I'm sorry, I forget which, which kid is which age. Uh, AJ is nine. Xander AJ is, is nine. Xander's. Okay. So say AJ, AJ has an explosive tantrum because what would be a reason he would have a hard time? Uh, cause he, he was disappointed because, uh, something he was planning on got shifted or canceled. Right. Okay. So when he's 30 years old and something gets shifted and canceled, and this is going to be unique to each kid, right? What does he need in order to, to deal with it in a way that doesn't cost him a relationship, a job, housing, whatever it may be? What skills does he need? A strategy or some sort of coping skill that will help him to be able to, to flex a little bit on uh, you know, maybe re rescheduling or you know, still being able to look ahead to that activity at a different sort of time. So he would need to be able to sort of pause the emotional piece of it so we can think it through first, right? So Absolutely. when you're saying coping skills, you know, being able to get off his last nerve and, you know, think with an actual neocortex and not just reactively, right? Yes. And validate those feelings. Yeah, this is really frustrating. Absolutely. But what's my best strategy moving forward? Right. Now, how do you take that down to nine years old and make it make sense in nine-year-old language in a nine-year-old scenario? Now you're raising an adult. I love that. I got now, that from Rob. Everything I know I got from Rob. <laughs> <laughs> now, let me ask you this. So this is uh, kind of the next question. Uh, so let's say there was a, a parent, I wouldn't say in crisis, but a parent who just wants to really up their game. Uh, they're they're okay as a parent, but they, they yell a lot or they get frustrated a lot and they just, they are lacking some skills. 
Let's mm -hmm. say this parent somehow magically they won the lottery and got one hour with Tiffany Sankofa. Hey, <laughs> <laughs> what? And let's say in that one hour you had the ability to oh, impart to this parent some skills or knowledge <laughs> or insight to help them the most in their growth as a parent. What would you do within that one hour of time? Ooh. Oh, that's a tough one. You're welcome. Wow. Yeah. Well, step one, and, and I'm sound like, you know, John at one note on this, but it, it's true. I always teach the that you and I have talked about self-regulation skills, mm -hmm. the things I do to get people off of their vagus nerves so that you literally switch out of a reactive brain and into your thinking brain. I think probably because I specialize in anxiety and trauma, I do a lot of that, but it's absolutely true for parenting. Anytime we're losing our minds, you literally are losing your mind. Your neocortex is going offline because your sympathetic nervous system is too active. So the first thing I would do is teach some of those self-regulation skills. I have six of them. They're all on video. You can watch them at three in the morning. And they're all you know? <laughs> they're glad they're helpful. But to, to first be able to recognize how to get in your right mind when you lose it, because you're going to lose it. Yeah. And once you get good at getting off of your last nerve and getting in your right mind, don't be afraid to, to probe around and understand what were the things that set you off. Mm. Because we think parenting is about our kids. The reality is kids have a tendency to grow up in spite of us anyway. Yes. I really think the parenting gig is our opportunity to do it better. It's our opportunity to see ourselves better and to become a better version of ourselves. Because we're going to be more compelled to do that for the sake of our kids. Without so that. you'll have an emotional courage. Most people have an emotional courage when it comes to fear, self-inventories and so forth. When they know it's affecting their children in a way that's not okay with them that they wouldn't necessarily do for themselves or even a partner. Mm -hmm. You know, because it's just sort of, we have this awareness. These, these are very impressionable little humans <laughs> and we can make some really negative impact if we want to here. Yes. So let's not, right? So but... I would teach the self-regulation skills. I would definitely teach the, you're not raising <laughs> children, you're raising adults, separating personhood from behavior. I would probably want to teach them fast forward parenting. It helps a lot, right? Um, there's so much, it really is tailored to the person in front of me, kind of what the need is or what the blocks might be. Sure. But I think another big one, and I don't, maybe this isn't so much in other places, but one thing that there's this, this uh, weirdness that parents do, they try to live through their kids. Yeah. Oh, that's, and it's yeah, all about, yeah. where are kids are in soccer and karate and did it. And, and so I see the kids and they're like, oh, I'm so stressed out, I can't function. You know, but this idea that your kids are a reflection of you or that their behavior is a reflection of your parenting. That is total bosh. Yes. Total bosh. You can do all kinds of fabulous things. Your kids can still choose to be little shits. It's just the way it works. You know, or you can you can do horrible things and still wind up with kids who are really decent human beings. You know, it's it's not. They're not a reflection of you. They are their own people. Yeah, absolutely. One thing that I really I talk a lot about with my students, but also with with our sons is so in, in talking about trying to expand like em, emotion and feelings, vocabulary. Yeah. So I know what it's like for me to be embarrassed. Yeah. I'm sure it's different for you. Tell me, what is it like when you feel embarrassed about something? And then the second question, the follow-up question is, what kind of things get you there? And so just awesome. helping them grow that way. Cause, and again, that's an education for me because we all handle different things differently. Right, right. And that taps into another thing that I think is fundamental to parenting is understanding that teaching them what to think is incredibly unhelpful mm. but helping them figure out how to think yes is lifelong learning right with that said you are a step parent what is what has that journey been like for you and <sighs> what would you say to other uh either soon to be step parents or current step parents what can you do to help foster a, a healthy step parent stepchild <laughs> relationship I'm step good. parenting has been one of the hardest things I've ever done. It's always a year mileage may vary. Everything in the world depends on how the two original parents get along or don't get along, how much they respect or don't respect each other, how much they can communicate or don't communicate, how much they um, support and uphold the other parent's relationship with the kid. And so as the step parent sort of on the sidelines there, it's, it's sort of like um, you, you picture a rope and you whip the rope. It's a mm -hmm. tiny little wave down here where they are, but I'm out here and it's like this for me, 
you know, <laughs> it's like, oh, you just did this and I just did this, you know, <laughs> because I'm way over here with no power in this situation whatsoever. Um, and it's, it was very hard for both Amari and I to step parent, um, sort of figure out where do the lines go. We both have step parents, but we have very different experiences. So he was raised by a stepfather, but his born to father wasn't in the picture. Okay. So it's very different. I, from age 10, have had a step, no, nine, have had a stepfather and 10, a stepmother. So I've had four parents my whole life. There's liabilities to that too. <laughs> you know? But it's not a foreign idea, a foreign concept to me that there can be multiple people who are in the parenting role and not all of them are born to's and so what? There's, you're in their household, you're, it's, this is a parent. My husband didn't have that same kind of feeling about it. Um, and like, for instance, he was really uncomfortable talking directly with my daughter when he had issues with her. Oh. He'd be like, well, can you talk to her about this, that, and the other thing? I'm like, no, that's triangulation. And he's like, stop therapizing me. I'm like, no, I'm just telling you my limits. I won't, I won't go between you. If you want me to help facilitate a conversation between the two of you, I'm happy to do that. But I'm not going to be your go-between because that hurts everybody's relationships. I so it. I think one of the saving graces for me is that I have really good colleague friends who are also therapists. One who's also, th one is the reason why I don't do as much kid therapy anymore because she's better at it than I am. So I just send them to her. <laughs> she really is. So when she's full, I'll take somebody, but I'd rather they saw her. To make things even more challenging, all four of us are neurospicy in one way or another. I love so that. each of us either has ADHD, is autistic, or is somewhere in between. And just by time period, we were just starting to understand that. I mean, I did not understand that my daughter is pretty autistic when she was growing up. I didn't know that. I knew Taylor was. I knew my stepson was. Um, but there's also, you know, we all have different traits and things like that. And sometimes they crash into each other. And also just all the things that I think and know about parenting Okay, now we're dealing with, those are actually what I learned first. We're all very neurobland. This makes sense in a neurobland family. It does not make sense in a neurospicy family. And so it, it just it puts a really interesting wrinkle and twist on things. And we had competing sensory needs. This was really challenging. Mm -hmm. okay. Yeah, my daughter's very, very sensitive to both sound and light. Both my husband and my stepson thrive on flooding with sound and light in order to be okay and be grounded. Okay. So this has been fun. Step parenting has been a very hard, hard journey. Um, I think Taylor and I have a much better relationship now. Great. I've had Good. much more candid conversations with him in his senior year of high school and now he's in college. Um, he talks to his father much more openly now too, which is really fun to watch. I love it. Now, now shifting ever so slightly, uh, so thinking of, so I, I work in a school I, and I have uh, parenting clients, you're a mental health therapist. Mental health, I think in our country right now is at a decline. So I mean, many think, adjectives. Yeah, yes. So <laughs> All the <point>. adjectives. <laughs> it, it's scary to see, uh, especially in more rural areas, like where I work, uh -huh. where, what people's attitudes are towards mental health, towards yeah. therapy. Uh, towards medication even. And so I wanted to ask you this. What would you say the, the biggest hurdle is towards good mental health in this day and age in our society? Can I give you two? Yes. Well, one's less, well, no, it is the barrier. So the one that's much more recent, um, and, and again, maybe it's different where you live. But where I live, all you have to do is go, you know, drive on the beltway for three seconds. And it's pretty obvious that the humans have gone completely feral. Mm. And I, I see it very much as an unprocessed trauma response from the pandemic. People are so ready to put it behind them that they're ignoring that there was micro and macro trauma. And yes. they're doing it very poorly. Self-regulation is terrible. Their ability is like, so as a country, we're really good at acute trauma. When things are on fire, 9-11, we're all in. You know, the meanest New Yorker on the planet is out there scooping you up off the ground and helping you, right? We're really good in acute crisis. We suck at chronic crisis. Mm. And this is chronic crisis, and it isn't done yet. We're like, no, it's all done. It's all done. I'm fine. I'm fine. I'm fine. I'm fine. Get out of my way. 
you're not fine. You're not fine. Stop pretending you're fine, people. You're not fine. And it has to be okay to say, I'm not fine, in order to figure out what we need in order to be healed. When things hit the fan, neighbors were so great in some ways, other than the ones that were buying all the toilet paper, a whole lot of people were looking out for each other in ways they hadn't before. Neighbors yep. were communicating in a way they hadn't before. We're good at acute crisis. We are now in chronic crisis and we suck. So that's one. Yes. Two is much more systemic. Not to get too sociology on it, but I don't think you can get away from that. Our country was literally built, built pre-colonial days forward on colonizer think. Mm. Colonizer think is an entire system. It's like if a country had were diagnosable, we are a narcissist. All things are either or, in or out. It's a constant fierce competition in this illusionary hierarchy of humans where there's only a top and a bottom. And you have to be on top no matter what the expense is, knock everybody else to the bottom. Right. And it plays out in every arena of what we do, which causes mental health crisis. Why are people anxious? Because the demands and the expectations of them are insane. It's an adaptive response to a crazy system. Why are people depressed? Because this is insane and they're not being valued as human beings. And as long as we're, we're valuing the I over the we, healing always, you know this as a social worker, healing always happens in the context of relationship. There's no way around that. There's no way around that. Number one determination of positive outcomes in therapy has nothing to do with the experience of the therapist, the orientation of the therapist, the modality that they use, the setting, the level of education. It doesn't, a number of years in, it has nothing to do with that. It's the relationship with the therapist and the client. Because all healing in human beings happens in the context of relationship. If it's just about knowing the stuff, we'd all just read the DSM and think, okay, don't do that. And we'd all be just perfectly fine. Right. And we get caught up in the wrong conversation. Well, we think the enemy is this particular political party or this particular candidate or this particular religion or this. No, the enemy is a way of thinking, which is good news because that's learned. You can unlearn it. Yeah. But it is baked into the systems. And so all of the things that I see, like a perfect example with kids, right? Okay. My, I do still have a physical office. I'm only there half a day a week. It's three blocks from one of the most affluent public high schools in the country. It's a place called River Hill High School. I've worked with kids from every high school in that county. It's Howard County, Maryland. It's one of the richest counties in the United States. It does have some diversity to it. I welcome the opportunity to be right there because they are the most messed up kids of all the kids in the county. Mm -hmm. They have way too much money and way too much discretionary time and way too little parenting that's actually involved in their lives. The social expectation at high school is brutal. It chews kids up like Pac-Man. If they're not in all AP classes and they're not getting all A's in those all AP classes, they're nothing. Yeah. That's colonizer think. So this, those kids come to me completely stressed out and anxious off the chain. And I think that's probably one of the biggest obstacles, not even seeing the system that we're baked into and that it is, excuse me, batshit crazy. Yeah, absolutely. Patently unhealthy, the complete inverse of the mutuality and respect that we're talking about, the complete inverse. And this yeah. is where I realized, you know, that a lot of my thinking and, and definitely a lot of my mother's thinking, my mother died never even knowing that she is Native American. She even held Native American cultures in high respect. She's always supported Navajo and Hopi communities. It's just what she did. She had no idea we are actually Native American. But her thinking has always been that way. All things in a circle, all things affect all things. We are part of a greater biome that includes humans. We're not above it. We're all part of it. Mutuality and respect. And healing happens in the context of community. I got all that from my mama. That's awesome. And it is the antithesis of the world we live in. The world we live in creates mental health crisis. Now how so to fight keep, back. You're doing it. We keep healing families and helping families come back to that place. One family at a time, one kid at a time.
or even when that family isn't going to be able to do that because the parents just can't, don't, they're too overwhelmed, they're too traumatized themselves to do it, we can introduce the idea to those kids, there's a different way to see, there's a different way to be. It, yeah. This isn't okay and it isn't normal. We have compassion for your parents, but there is something finer for all of you. Yeah, absolutely. Great, great answer on, on that question. Thank you. So now shifting the, the tone. All right, thinking back to your life as a mama, <laughs> <laughs> what is the most embarrassing parenting moment of your life? Yeah, you, you gave me a heads up on this one. It came immediately. Every client is not the right client for every therapist. And I was working with the family. You might have a great rapport with the kids, but you got to have great rapport with the parents. Mm. And if the kid comes in and you're like, well, they're kind of showing that some things need to change in the system. And the parent goes, oh, we're leaving. <laughs> you're not, you're not going to get anywhere with them, right? right? So I had one such parent who had flushed me as therapist, even though I got along great with her kids. I was at a Subway sandwich shop with my daughter. And she was having a full out meltdown, totally anxious. Her social anxiety is off the chart, which now we understand is part and parcel of the autism as well, because she, it's like she's constantly being spoken to in a language that makes no sense to her. Yeah. And she's supposed to come up with the answer, come up with the answer, come up with the answer. And she's feeling the sound and the lights and the everything, you know, and she was pretty young. She was like seven or eight years old. I, I didn't know that yet. I, didn't, I knew she was anxious. And I knew that everything that worked for my anxious kids didn't work for her. So I was having a terrible day. She was having a terrible moment. I lost it. I yelled at her. I looked like the worst parent on the planet. And I turned around and that parent was sitting there with her kids looking at me like, I knew you were an idiot. <laughs> I always like the moments where I, where I lose it with, with our son. Uh, sons, but especially the youngest. I, I'll always like. I'll after I've finished yelling, I'll look. Was the front door closed? <laughs> right. <laughs> or w was I in the driveway when I began yelling? <laughs> yeah. So and keep also in mind. Keep in mind, I didn't move into a house till my daughter was already grown and my stepson was almost grown. So that means most of these horrible parenting things happened in apartments with lots of people hearing it all. And no matter where you live, you you can't escape it. And again, that's just. I don't know. That's where grace go. You know, where, where we need to Preach. give ourselves grace too. Preach. Yeah. yeah. And and I mean, it, you know, it definitely helps you n never become pretentious. Mm -hmm. You're never going to pretend you have it all together. You know the answers. You're such a great person. No, we all stink at this. Yeah. yeah. And then being masters of repair too, uh, yes. being able to say those tough words, and not just. Exactly. Not just I'm sorry, but like having that art of a good apology, being able to take responsibility. Right. And if I could impart to some parents uh, that I see, I mean, I, I've listened to parents of of teens, you know, tweens and teens, even where they talk to, talk down to them as if they're little yeah. kids. And right, you know, we we talk to to our two sons. I mean, they're that one just turned nine, one's about to turn eleven. And we 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 don't use you know baby voices unless we're being no, we're being, being playful, but <laughs> right. uh, we talk to them as as if we, like you said earlier before going on, on the top shelf, yeah yeah, and, and they they get more than we give them credit for, and and then they're able to then process more than we give them credit for, absolutely. And so when we when we make those uh, attempts to repair, if we are sincere about it, and and they I mean if, if we're not sincere about it, they can smell it. They know it. Absolutely. They know you're full of it and they're going to act out and make sure you know it. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah. That's, I think that's the other thing. That's the other thing. Just before I forget it, because sure. I will, because in school, a lot of it, they're in a contained environment and certain behaviors really impede the process. So I get it. But I think we can easily forget that all behavior is purposeful. Kids don't do awful things. I hate the phrase acting out. What they're doing is showing you that something is not okay and they don't know what to do with it. And this yeah. is the only language that they have to tell you, I'm lost and I don't know what to do with this. Something is very wrong and I don't know how to fix it. Yeah. So instead of demonizing the behavior, both in the kids and in ourselves, right? It's understanding, okay, this behavior is telling me something. Yeah. And usually what it's telling me is I need help outside of my head because this isn't enough. And that's where co-regulation comes in, right? Yes, I, I think absolutely. so. I mean, because kids aren't going to 
you know, adolescence doesn't end until 25 or 30 years old. Right. And so we don't always have that ability, even, you know, young adults don't have the ability always to, to regulate their emotions. So that's why they, they need someone to come alongside them. Working in a school, I hear it daily where there'll yeah. be a yelling, angry teacher yelling at a kid, mm-hmm. you know, for kid things. Right. And it's like, you know what, if you only knew that you're right. making it worse, why don't you co-regulate with this kid, help them to calm down, then you can work through whatever the problem is. Co-regulation. You made a really interesting point. This is something that was really cool. My daughter, I love my daughter's generation. She was born in 97, so she's like a late, late, okay. or uh, was she an early, early millennial? No, she's late, late millennial. That her peers, I love them so much. They're such a cool group of people. But one of the things that she and her friends did in college, and not just them, I heard it from other people the same age, they have snuggle buddies. Mm-hmm. It's not sex. They literally just mm-hmm. snuggle together. And it's not even about sensual touch, but that co-regulation thing, right? It's like, okay, I'm feeling very uncalm. You're very calm. Let's sleep together. Let me sleep with my head on you. And it, I think this is beautiful. I think more so- people need that. Yeah, you know, I, I see them. I see, you know, whether it's uh, like, you know, uh, you know, just friends walking down the hall, you know, holding mm-hmm. hands. Or, yes, exactly. Or exactly. lots of hugs, and it. Right. And sometimes teachers really lose their stuff about that. It's like, right. What? There's a purpose to this because they kind of need that. Well, they don't get that at home. And keep in mind, this is also a generation who has been raised on consent as a thing. So if mm. consent is real and they're practicing consent, those that's consensual positive touch. Yes. It's not coerced. It's not demanded. It's not invasive. It was agreed upon. Yeah. And I think sometimes that's hard for us old heads to get because I know, well, you're a little younger than I am, I think. But um, consent was absolutely not a thing when I was growing up, especially no. for females. I believe it. Yeah. You know, and I won't even get to the whole spanking thing and how that set us up for that. But that is a piece of it as well. You know, somebody can, can invade your body anytime they want. You don't have say over your body. Mm. So the current kids, they're not growing up with that. Thank God. I'm so glad. Yeah. And I'm, I'm thankful to have shifted away from, from corporal punishment and, and from timeouts as well. The last question is this. What is one last thing you would like to put out on the table to our Confluence Parenting listeners? One. One. <laughs> hey, one and a half if you need to. Come on. Now. Have supportive community. Places where mm-hmm. you can be insanely candid. Where you can say things like, I actually really wanted to kill my child yesterday. Right. And I had it, the weapon in my hand. So a place where you can be real. Yeah. And be and be met there with somebody who's not going to shame you. Somebody's going to empathize. Somebody who might have some ideas. And if they don't, they can at least care. Yeah. And it, I think it's really hard to find that unless you know where to look. I yeah. think friendships in close confidential, you know, confidant type relationships like that for adults is really hard to come by um, because of busyness or our own, you know, fear of being rejected or fear of looking weak. What would you suggest as far as parents trying to find that community? They're in there somewhere. You're mostly going to find them through affinity. People are doing things that are similar Mm -hmm. to what you do, whether it's they go to the same church you do, or they have the same sport that you do, or they you know, have the same hobby that you do or same volunteer organization that you do. We usually really grow uh, relationships based on shared activity. Sure. So, you know, I'm thinking about in Native American communities that are that have a community, like we're disenfranchised, but the ones that have actual community, there's all kinds of natural social connection opportunities. Everybody's there together. Yeah. We don't have that. But that kind of multi-generational support, I think, is incredibly helpful. So also look at people in a different generation than you are, people who are older than you and people who are younger than you. Get these different perspectives um, and help each other. Honestly, affinity is about the the best I can come up with. Because you're going to find people who are more like-minded if they're doing the same things that you do. Yeah. Yeah, Well, I mean, uh, how did we meet? You and I met, although we're cousins. We met online in online. in a family history and uh, yeah. was it a Melungeon group? I'm not even really sure. Probably one uh, of them. Yeah, I remember yeah. the groups. <laughs> yeah, I don't take lightly your suggestion of affinity. I mean, you never really know how how real someone is being 
a lot of us are just, you know, we are who we are, wherever we are. You're certainly like that. I know I work really hard at being like that. And some people aren't. Some people will put on a front, but eventually the front will fall apart. Yeah. So finding people that you at least have a sense are being genuine and authentic and not just showing you a side of themselves. Yeah. That's pretty important. But, you know, it. my, my husband does this thing I love. He says, you know, trust but verify. It doesn't make sense to completely trust whoever. That's That will get you seriously harmed. Yes. You know, there are people out there who are very broken and very exploitive. You don't need that. And there are people who have terrible boundaries. There's people who just have really incompatible uh, values for friendship with. And that's okay. There's nothing wrong with either one of you. It's just not compatible with each other, right? Right. But or, if you, or healthy, yeah. Yeah. So if you can give preliminary trust and see what somebody does with it, just on something that doesn't matter as much. Yeah. You know? And see what they do with it. And if they seem to handle it responsibly, then, okay, I can try a little bit more, a little bit, a little bit more. And eventually you're going to hit, most likely going to hit an edge where, okay, this is as far as I'm going to trust this person. Yeah. And even if you just find one or two people that can be that connection where you can confide in, I mean, that one or two is enough. Absolutely. Well, yeah, one or two, I would suggest two, because sometimes people aren't available. Sometimes neither one will be available, and then you learn that you can manage for yourself. But yes. if you can have somebody else, that's great. There's a proverb that says a man of many friends comes to ruin. There's a reason for that. You don't need a whole host. Yeah. You don't need an army. You don't need there to be 30 people. You just need some who are really good, yeah. who you can be yeah. really good with. Well, Tiffany, thank you so much, cousin, for and hanging out with me for this last hour. And I, even though you said your brain was melting because you're an oh, hour ahead of me, you're on the East Coast. <laughs> but your melty brain produced a lot of uh, warmth and insight and humor. And so whatever your melty brain produced, I greatly appreciate it. <laughs> Brandon, it is always good to be with you, even when I can't see your face. I know. Somehow <laughs> I've disappeared. Tiffany. No, thank you for the opportunity. I, I've said it before. I'll say it again. I'll say it a million times. I love what you're doing with Confluence. You are being such an agent of healing for so many people. And it's beautiful. Thank you very much. I appreciate that. And Keep it going. Absolutely. And uh, yeah, and keep on. So again, talking about mental health, keep on doing what you're doing. You're influencing individuals and families in, in your community. I like that. So, plan. All, All right. right. Well, Tiffany, thank Take you so much. Take care of yourself. All Hugs right. and loves to the family. Will do.